to you. Great. Thanks, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's well. Um, it's the end of the season, I'm afraid, for our, our CCI seminars, and we'll be back in the end of September with a new season. But I think it's only appropriate that we end up with a botanical theme for the last one. We'll finish on a high note. So I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. James Burrell. Uh, James is a research fellow at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, my old stomping ground many years ago. And James is looking at the the nexus between conservation, adaptation, and spatial patterns for biodiversity, and has a case particular project looking at the agri-systems agri of the Ethiopian highlands, and particularly looking at benefit sharing and how that can support the conservation of both wild and cultivated plant resources. And uh, James has got his suitably bush shirt on and appears to be broadcasting directly from the Ethiopian highlands. So. <laughs> James, thank you for joining us, and and over to you. Great, thanks, thanks very much. I'll just do the normal, slightly awkward thing where you try to just share your screen at the at the same time as as talking without you know, trying to concentrate. Uh, can can someone see that? Is that working? Yes. Yeah, great. Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you, thank you, very much, uh, everyone, for coming, and and thanks for having me, and thanks for the introduction. Um, real pleasure to talk to to all of you guys. So I guess what I'm going to try and sell to you today is the idea that conservation is really cool of wild stuff and primates and, you know, birds. I, I like birds and bird watcher. That's all really nice, except what you really want to be doing is trying to conserve agrobiodiversity. So um, if I if I do my job in the next 40 minutes, I'm going to try and sell that to you and you'll all try and shift your research focus more towards crops and all those much cooler animals. So that's what I'm, I'm going to try and do. So here, here's where my argument starts. So, so global land use, we use about half of habitable land for agriculture. And that's grown from, it would have been about 4% a thousand years ago. So, so agriculture is this big sort of evil beast that's uh, using all of the land, you know, instead of all those wonderful protected areas and wild biodiversity that we really like. And so this massive fundamental shift uh, in land use towards um, just things that basically benefit us um, has probably rightly been called um, a, a disaster. You know, here's a couple of papers. The one on the left um, analyzed the main drivers of, of threat on the IUCN red list. And it found that agriculture and overexploitation are greater threats than even climate change, at least for the moment. And even in the cool, trendy, big recent summaries like the Living Planet Index, um, WWF and, and, and others, they highlight uh, that agriculture is you know, the main driver of biodiversity loss. And I think that's a little bit mean to the sort of 600 million um, often poor smallholder farmers that do most of agriculture around the world. But, but anyway, I can see the point. I can see where we're coming from on that. And so much so that um, the famous Jared Diamond even said that shifting to agriculture is the worst mistake in the history of the human race. And there's, there's even studies that show uh, just before agriculture, you know, um, health and uh, lifespan and so on was slightly higher than in the early shift to agriculture. So, so maybe he's right. But I, I would just point out that biodiversity loss is not just a phenomenon since we started doing agriculture about 10 or 11 or 12,000 years ago. In fact, all the coolest stuff, uh, the megafauna, um, which I'd, I'd love to study, but I don't, uh, all of that disappeared even before we were doing agriculture in many parts of the world. So by no means is agriculture the new phenomenon that's been driving biodiversity loss just recently. It's just the latest of the tools that we use to get the products that we need from the natural world. And it's also a little bit mean to blame everything on agriculture because we wouldn't be having this conversation uh, if it wasn't for agriculture, right? Uh, so the specialization that that allowed us to do, uh, developing cities and civilizations out of agriculture, we wouldn't be sitting here thinking about all of this if it wasn't for the massive economies and efficiencies that agriculture provides. 
on a on a silly small scale, you know, if we all hadn't had our lunch or, 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 or hadn't been able to get food over the last few days, we wouldn't be coming to work and doing this. But on a much bigger way of thinking, it's pretty much the foundation of everything we do. So to just blame uh, the biodiversity crisis on agriculture is a bit circular. Um, so perhaps it's useful to try and break it down to some slightly more manageable components. So where, what do we know about uh, the origins of agriculture? So this is, this is a map of what's called the, the Vavilov centers or the, the Vavilov centers of origin or, or crop domestication. Uh, Nikolai Vavilov was, was quite a cool chap uh, about a century ago, went around the world um, collecting seeds, mostly from cereals. And he went to the Ethiopian highlands as well, but only the northern part. And he really came up with this concept of centers of crop diversity. Unfortunately, it wasn't especially popular um, with Stalin. And eventually he ended up in a, in a prison, unfortunately, and, and died. Um, but his work was incredibly important. And what's really interesting is that agriculture clearly offers some fundamental advantages because 12,000 years ago, pretty much everyone lived as a hunter-gatherer, but by 5,000 years ago, most people lived as farmers. And agriculture involved, evolved or was invented independently somewhere between maybe five, seven, 11 times in quite rapid succession around the world, central Mexico, Ethiopian highlands, the Fertile Crescent, the New Guinea highlands. So it clearly offers some quite fundamental advantages. But to maybe just switch a gear a moment to psychology. So I'm a, I'm a conservationist, like I imagine most people in here, and I'm interested in preserving wild biodiversity. But I really see agriculture as the strongest tool we have to try and achieve that. I, I really like um, this. This is, this is from psychology. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy. I won't pretend to be able to properly explain it. But basically, to talk about all the complicated stuff like science and conservation and, and big goals in the future and working together, collaborating, you know, things like the UN and the World Bank, you really need to meet all your basic needs first. And food security and health and well-being and shelter, they are those things you, you need to, to meet first. So I'm really lucky to do quite a lot of work in Madagascar and Ethiopia. And right now, uh, Madagascar is facing one of the worst famines uh, in years in the, in the far south. And Ethiopia is facing similar food crisis. The, this is the famine early warning system. Um, in the north, in Tigray, it's, it's partly driven by conflict. But, it, but this is a reoccurring problem um, in one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, at least, at least for plant biodiversity. So, I would argue that it's quite difficult to work with our collaborators and our colleagues in Madagascar and go straight on to a conversation about conservation and why we should conserve all the wonderful birds and, and, and things like that, if we can't address the much more pressing needs like, like food security first. So whilst conservation might be on top of our priority list because we're at the we've we've reached a quite high level on Maslow's hierarchy, it's much lower down other people's lists. And so when we're thinking about things like the sustainable development goals, actually zero hunger and good health and well-being, they're pretty foundational to being able to deliver some of the benefits from all the others. For example, peace and justice. A lot of conflict at its core is over land and resources. Uh, quality education, that's very difficult to deliver without health and nutrition. So when it comes down to it, we have this big trade-off between agriculture being this biggest threat to biodiversity and from a from one sort of lens then sure that's that's true but equally agriculture is pretty much better than any other way we've come up with of developing and fulfilling all our needs from the natural world i would trade quite a lot of conservation work for a one percent improvement in agriculture um, so we have this this trade-off and instead of seeing them as opposing forces perhaps it's better to try and think about how they can work together. And that handily is what I'm gonna try and talk about today. So biodiversity, what is the basis of sustainable agriculture? So there's a whole slew of papers and I started trying to, I was gonna put all the little titles and everything like that, but it's, a, it's an active research topic that diversity underpins resilience. And resilience is, is the buzzword, put it in your grants, put it in your papers. That's what we all want, especially under climate change. 
but there's a growing body of evidence that, that having biodiversity brings resilience to ecosystems, whether it's a, a petri dish of bacteria or a, or a tropical rainforest. And there's an equally growing, perhaps smaller, but there's another body of evidence that suggests the same thing is true for agrobiodiversity. A country that has diverse crops tends to have more stable food security than a country that grows just a handful. And it's the same for supply chains and so on and so forth. And I should just say, when I'm talking about agrobiodiversity, uh, I don't have a, a beautiful definition, but it's essentially a subset of wild biodiversity. So when I'm talking about the two, I'm gonna talk about wild biodiversity on the one hand, and I'm gonna talk about agrobiodiversity on the other hand. So let's just compare what we know about wild biodiversity, which I'm sure is the thing that we're all started off most interested in anyway. And that's the thing we're trying to protect. And we'll compare what we know about wild biodiversity to agrobiodiversity, which is kind of the major driver of its destruction, but it's also the best tool we have. Ooh, and so wild biodiversity. We have a fairly good idea of the distribution of wild diversity. That's, that's true at least if, when you say wild diversity, you mean vertebrates and especially things like birds. But we'll, we'll set that aside, plants are hard uh, and, and maybe seem less interesting. Uh, but we have a fairly good idea of where the world's biodiversity is. So what about agrobiodiversity? Sure, we have uh, a similar, perhaps not so good, slightly out of date uh, idea of where agrobiodiversity is, but it's also based on, on a subset. So whereas wild biodiversity is at least thousands and thousands of species, even if it's certain groups, uh, our understanding of where agrobiodiversity or crop diversity is, is based on just about 175 crops. But it, it gives us an idea, they look similar. The other thing we know about is where our crops come from. And this was building a lot on the work of Nikolai Vavilov. Uh, and so we know the centers of origin and, it, and it's the same as that, that map earlier. We know that coffee, Enset, Pef, for example, um, come from Ethiopia. Many grains come from um, the Fertile Crescent, uh, potatoes and tomatoes from the New World. And that can be really useful as well, because not only is it fascinating to just understand our history and how, thing, how plants moved around the world, but also centers of origin is often where the highest genetic diversity is. And so a big part of agrobiodiversity is not just having lots of different species, famous for wild biodiversity, it's about having uh, genetic diversity as well. All those varieties uh, often in crops, they're called land races. So knowing about that is really useful as well. But some work just recently at Kew, um, that I only had a very small part in, but Kew's State of the World's Plants and Fungi, we have a, a database that so far, uh, the number changes every year, we're, we're finding more and more evidence. We know of more than 7,000 uh, plant species that have been documented as being eaten by humans of one culture or another in, in human history. But only 417 of those are considered food crops. They're ones that people know about. And an even smaller subset of those you saw, we actually have enough data to map. So we know that we're only using a fraction of that available crop diversity. Now, what about trends? So this is the famous uh, Living Planet Index, um, which you know, plots the de decline of um, basically vertebrates across the world. And in fact, we have it, at, at we, I say we in the sort of the royal sense, but we, we understand it at, a, at a, 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 an increasingly fine scale. Now, that's, that's an amazing tool to have to understand biodiversity loss even if it is just since 1970 and for a subset of species. But what do we know? Do we have a comparative thing for crops? Considering that we all depend on crops every day, do we have a similar understanding of agrobiodiversity loss? Well, not really. I, I might be being mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to give some, some infographics instead. But we know of about 410,000 uh, global plant species now. Uh, the numbers increased a bit. We know of 7,000 crops used by humans but we get more than 50% of our world's calories from just three species. And what's even kind of scarier, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the word scary, is if you actually look at where those three species are on, on, the, on the tree of life, they all come from one tiny little group of the monocots. So 
if you wanted to put all your eggs in one basket or all your, all your cereals in one basket, that would be one way to do it. And over time, this is a nice uh, paper from Colin Corey, we can actually see that, so those rings are from different years and that's the diversity of countries' uh, um, agri-systems essentially. And we can see that we're getting a, a, a homogenization. The points are getting closer and closer together through time. So we know something about the fact that we're losing agrobiodiversity and we're, we're homogenizing agrobiodiversity around the world as we increase trade. But actually, I would say that we, we know an awful lot more about the, the wild biodiversity crisis than we do about the agrobiodiversity crisis. And I put it as a big question mark because considering how much we depend on it and considering how much our success with conservation of wild biodiversity depends on having efficient agriculture, I would say that this is a little bit of a blind spot. So, so my question, and that's why uh, I'm, I'm really lucky to be talking to, you know, world leading conservationists all listening to this talk, is can we take loads of the, the really hard earned lessons that we've got from conservation, you know, like area based conservation and red lists and all this kind of stuff. And can we use some of that to apply to agriculture to kind of, if we had to invent it all from scratch, that would take forever. So what can we learn from conservation that we can apply to, to agriculture? Because it needs conserving in just the same way. So here's, here's where I suggest we start. So global biodiversity hotspots, I'm sure you've all heard of them. Well, do they overlap with centers of crop diversity? Well, sort of, yes, quite a lot, but not exactly. So that's the first step. This was from a, a paper um, led by one of my colleagues at Q, Sam Piranon last year, really nice paper, looking at the overlap between wild and, and agro biodiversity. But what about if we try to use more species? So that's a very, very coarse view. What about edible species? Well, it's interesting that the crops that we recognize as crops, so 171 have enough data to, to really uh, map, they are all unsurprisingly kind of localized to Europe. They come from Europe, the Fertile Crescent, the Mediterranean, North Africa, mostly, and parts of Asia. And it's not surprising that the ones we recognize as crops are often the ones that have had the most investment. Those major crops might not be a good proxy for where the rest of agrobiodiversity is. If we look at the native range of the 7,000 or so edible species for which we have good enough data, Actually, a lot of that is from Africa and Southeast Asia. And it's actually intriguing that it's from Africa, considering uh, that is where we evolved for so long throughout our evolutionary history. It's perhaps not surprising that that's where the most species that, that, that we are able to eat exist. But that's still probably not quite enough to work out how we can go about conserving this agrobiodiversity. And these really cool stuff was made by uh, Sam Piranon and Jan Onda at, at, at Kew last year. Uh, so I want to talk to you about the Ethiopian highlands. So Ethiopian highlands, and I, and I would say this because this is where I work, but this is one of those pictures you make in the introduction of a paper. Ethiopian highlands is a perfect uh, place to try and understand what drives biodiversity and agrobiodiversity patterns at the same time. So it's part of the Horn of Africa um, global uh, biodiversity hotspot. It's got the second highest uh, endemic plant diversity in Africa. It's got something like 80% of Africa's highlands. And it's just an amazing country with in incredibly kind and brilliant people as well. But it's also a center of crop diversity. Coffee, heck, it's a center, a secondary center of yam and wheat diversity. And of course, NSET, which is this awesome crop I'm going to talk to you about. And globally, we're starting to understand something about what drives biodiversity patterns. I don't think it's solved yet. But we, we know about latitudinal gradients, so there's more species near the tropics than, than there are at high latitudes. We know something about energy gradients and area gradients, and that climate stability often leads to evolution of, of more diversity as well, especially in plants. But do the same things drive agrobiodiversity patterns? If we can understand, instead of where they are, because Agrobiodiversity can change very quickly with policies and governments, and we often lack data. But if we can understand what drives it instead of just mapping where it is, then we can start to 
conserve those processes that generated that agrobiodiversity at the same time. So it's understanding the mechanisms rather than just recording the pattern. And it's impossible to really talk about um, Ethiopia without just mentioning, of course, the cultural and the linguistic diversity as well. I believe there is 81 recognized languages. There's something like 68 different uh, ethnic groups um, that just have the most wonderful diversity of culture. And you can see from this map that there's a real hotspot of diversity down in the southwest there. Uh, and that's where we've, we've done a lot of our work. And I wanted to just highlight another really cool paper uh, that I just can't get enough of, nothing to do with me, but it's, it's looking at the ecological drivers of variation in language diversity at the same time. I can, I can post a link to it in the chat. And it's worth just setting the scene with, with what they found on a global scale. And the, the current understanding of what drives language diversity is actually the length of the growing season rather than topography or anything like that. And the longer your growing season, the smaller the cultural group can persist in a, in a self-sufficient way. So you get larger numbers of cultural groups isolating themselves to an extent within a, within a given area. And so the longer the crop growing season, the more per unit area of cultures and eventually languages you can get. And this pattern seems to hold for most parts of the world, including Ethiopia. So I want you to hold that in mind when we look at the, the next stage. So Ethiopia is really good for another reason, and I should just say that um, uh, uh, Dr. Maribel Soto Gomez, um, who is, is a Q uh, in our group at the moment, uh, collected or collated a lot of the data for this. But we're really lucky with Ethiopia that the World Bank recently funded a whole series of very, very, very in-depth agricultural surveys, which must just have been the most enormous amount of work. Um, and we really wouldn't have been able to do that without this. And then on the wild biodiversity side, we've trawled through thousands and thousands of thousands of herbarium and GBIF and biodiversity records from thousands of plant collectors over the last hundred years. Uh, so none of this would be possible without the thousands of people that have contributed to both those data sets. And so what we're trying to understand is whether things like climate, so that's the length of the growing season, seasonality, uh, environmental change, uh, socio-culture drivers, and, and things like topology, so like the elevational range, which is the sort of diversity of, of habitats, to, be, to put it crudely, within a cell, how they contribute to patterns of wild plant diversity, agrobiodiversity, and linguistic biodiversity. And it might sound really simplistic, but they're all biodiversity. We're biologists, or at least I guess a lot of you are, so we tend to think everything is just biology or ecology at its core. So are they driven by the same things? And what I would say is this is kind of hot off the press. So it might sort of, well, not actually press, it's not published. It's kind of hot off my R script. So it could change. So don't take any of this as, as the absolute truth, but this is what we think at the moment. And what we're finding is indeed, yes, they seem to be driven by very, very similar processes. So at least the length of the growing season uh, for agro biodiversity and linguistic biodiversity, I'll show you maps in a moment, it's immediately apparent that agro biodiversity and linguistic biodiversity, is, they seem to be distributed in the same ways. But the other thing that's interesting to note is that poverty also drives down not only wild biodiversity, you can imagine people having to use more of their natural resources, but also agro biodiversity, which was interesting. There's often a perception that it's the remote places that retain their agro biodiversity. But at least in Ethiopia, that's not what we see. And it also drives down linguistic diversity as well. So it's quite remarkable. And, and I should just say things like, so we see those as the two most you know, insightful, interesting things. Elevation range, it's almost like a covary. We expect some cells contain bits of a mountain and a valley. So we expect those to have more species, more wild and domesticated species. So they're almost like covariates. So we're really excited to see these similar patterns. And if we, if we look at them on a map, then yes, certainly linguistic diversity and agrobiodiversity, they seem to be uh, quite strongly overlapping. The, the, the top right of Ethiopia there, that's the Danakil depression, which goes down to 400 meters below sea level. So not good for crops, not especially good uh, for people either. And wild biodiversity, again, it looks similar. But of those three, uh, the one that has perhaps been 
most um, impacted and changed in its distribution is probably wild biodiversity. It may not reflect perhaps what it looked like pre-human impact. Of course, language and agrobiodiversity are the product of human impact. So if we look at the partial effect of just those ecological variables, and we try and get rid of the effect of um, accessibility and travel time and towns and populations and things, then actually this is the adjusted wild biodiversity. It actually starts to look increasingly similar. So from a scientist's point of view, I just think it's really cool. These things look similar. They're highly correlated. Um, you know, correlation doesn't mean causation. These things could be interacting in, in ways we don't understand yet. But that leads us to another question. On the one hand, you could say, great, agrobiodiversity is in the same places of wild biodiversity. Uh, we understand it. That's cool. One set of places to conserve. But on the other hand, is there now competition? Are you, I'm saying you for some protected area manager, are you saying we need to conserve this as rainforest? And I'm saying this is the perfect place for a load of small holder farms and home gardens that can hold you know, huge amounts of crop diversity. Are they in competition? Well, on the one hand, yes, but I'm an optimist. So I want to try and sell to you how they don't have to be in competition, how they can work in synergy. So this is a figure from a grant that was rejected last year, but I still think it's a really good idea. Um, and that is that we, at least in Ethiopia, we would really like to try and sell the buffer zones where sustainable uh, use of resources is allowed as agrobiodiversity conservation zones. So we really see that the core areas for wild biodiversity, they go hand in hand with agrobiodiversity at the same time. And that's because of gene flow. So we tend to find the highest uh, crop genetic diversity where they co-occur with their wild crop relatives. And you're getting that gene flow from the wild. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit more in a minute. But to just give an example of the fact that it does work, this is Kaffir Biosphere Reserve. So quite a lot of forest has been lost in Ethiopia. There are amazing parts left. I would encourage you to collaborate with Ethiopian colleagues and, and conserve their amazing natural biodiversity. But the Kaffir Biosphere Reserve is a really, really great success story. Kaffir is, uh, it comes from the Ethiopian word for coffee. Kaffir, uh, people from Kaffir proudly tell you that, that they domesticated coffee. So every time you drink, every time you drink it, think of this beautiful place. But Kaffir Biosphere Reserve exists and is well protected and is working because the whole of the understory is wild coffee. And Ethiopia recognizes that it gets a huge proportion of its income from selling coffee. And if it wants to keep adapting coffee with climate change, it needs all that wild biodiversity. So the communities all around it, they, use, they grow wild coffee in their home gardens, but they are benefiting from gene flow from this amazing repository of, of coffee diversity in the understory of this, of this protected area. And it works for coffee, and so it could work for other crops too. Now, that's been a nice story. All I really wanted to talk to you about was NSET, which is this amazing plant that I, I work on myself. And I wanna show you how this fits wonderfully into this kind of framework. So next time you see one of these, or you have one of these for your breakfast, um, it's not a banana, it's a false NSET. So, so the NSA that I work on, it's often called false banana. We, we're going to try and switch that around. And it's an example of an orphan crop. So I told you there's 7,000 edible species, uh, but there's only a handful that we really consider as domesticated crops. And a great example is this crop from Ethiopia. So a little bit of a backstory. Bananas come from Southeast Asia. They're from more or less domesticated from uh, two species of a much wider pool of about 70. But sometime around 40 million years ago, a handful of banana relatives made it to Africa, and that was from genus NSEP. And what's fascinating about NSEP ventricosum, which is the one I want to talk to you about, is that it's got this wild distribution all down East and Southern Africa, and no one uses it. No one even thinks it's edible. Uh, they, they laugh at you if you say people eat it. Yet in Ethiopia, it's the staple food for 20 million people. And in Southwest Ethiopia, it's absolutely everywhere and it's delicious. And there's a restaurant in London called Enset Restaurant that I urge you to go to near Vauxhall. So what does it look like? Well, it's this amazing perennial, uh, giant perennial monocarp uh, herb and uh, 
That's Paul Wilkin from Kew standing next to one that's about 10 meters tall. And it does produce bananas, but they're full of uh, thick, hard seeds. And that's where it gets its name, the false banana. And the picture on the bottom right there is cocho, which is the bread you make from it. Now, NSET is one of these remarkable underutilized crops because it has all of these amazing properties. This is it in the wild on the left, and then it um, grown on a farm on the right. And some of the amazing things, I don't know if, if, if you're from, from Europe or at least a temperate country like me, when you think of crops, I tend to think of cereals. And so the properties of NSET come as just really quite strange and wonderful to me. And that's the fact that uh, it can be planted at any time of year, harvested at any time of year, it's drought tolerant, it's clonally propagated, so you can take one that you like and you can rapidly multiply it. Then it's fermented underground and you can, so you can store it as standing stock and harvest it when you need it, or you can store it underground and use it when you need it. And Ethiopia has a huge diversity of climates and NSET has adapted from living in the tropical rainforest of the West to this 2000 meter elevation or range of climate. So it's this absolutely amazing crop and that's why it's earned the name of the tree against hunger. That's what it's known as um, in, in one of the Ethiopian languages. And it's incredibly important to several different ethnic groups whole identity. And NSET's been increasing recently and it's actually the set after maize, it's the second most produced crop in Ethiopia. But if you're anything like me, before you, you, you work or you start collaborating in Ethiopia, you've never heard of it. And that's the same for many, many, many crops like this around the world. It's diversified into being used for fiber. Um, it's used for baking bread. Um, you can just see a, a few of the pictures of processing it. And one of the amazing things about NSET is it's agrobiodiversity. So NSET isn't just one thing. We know of more than 1500 different named land races. And a land race is a bit like a, a different variety. And the one in red there is used for medicine. Some of them are sweet, some of them are bitter, some of them are disease tolerant, some of them are drought tolerant, some of them are frost tolerant, some of them are easier to dig up because they have weaker roots, some are harder. There's this amazing diversity. And I think of it like apples. Uh, I think how many apples could I name? And if I went into a shop, how many apples could I identify? from their phenotype, yet you go to a, an Ethiopian farm, the average farm, just the average farm grows seven different types of NSET and some grow up to 24. And they're fulfilling all those different purposes and that's just one crop. But here's the, the kicker, and this is some really nice uh, population genetic stuff done by postdoc uh, Dr. Ollie White, who's, who's just, just, just got a really great job at the NHM. Um, and that is that only about a third of NSET genetic diversity is in the domesticated crops. So wild NSET is inedible. It's called the devil's NSET because it's black and bitter. Uh, and so only about a third of that diversity made it through that domestication bottleneck. So there's that incredible pool of diversity still out there in the wild. And I should say that's only for Ethiopia. Our samples are only for Ethiopia. So think about what other potential drought tolerance or disease tolerance attributes are in the rest of, of NSET's range. Now, the really amazing thing about NSET is that it's got this role in buffering seasonal food insecurity. So if you only need food insecurity for say a week of the year, for you to have perhaps a, an impact, have to go hunting or clear more land in a protected area or something like that. It's, it's not just uh, chronic food insecurity that causes these things, but it can be acute too. And so the amazing thing about NSET is that it's this standing stock. And some years you can use more, some years you can use less if your other crops are successful. Um, and so for many communities, having this, this sort of backup resource, this sort of standing capital of NSET is this insurance policy. And so I've got some nice work here by a master's student uh, called Olev Koch, uh, who's been modeling what other communities in, uh, in Eastern the Horn of Africa have low agricultural inputs, so you don't need uh, um, irrigation or anything for NSET, could, could NSET offer these attributes too? So particularly in uh, Uganda, R Rwanda, Tanzania. And it's also worth pointing out that NSET is very high in iron and zinc, which are two of the major deficiencies in Northern Ethiopia. So NSET's only grown in Southern Ethiopia. So I could probably sell to you that NSET is this wonder crop. I specifically never ever call it a wonder crop because they're all wonderful. 
I could sell to you that NSET's got these amazing sets of attributes, but there's nothing special about NSET. That's just one of the 7,000 species that we know we eat. There's a really nice project called the African Orphan Crop Consortium that's trying to work on 100 uh, very promising underutilized crops. It's, it's probably a fluke of luck that we happen to eat uh, rice, wheat, maize. It could have easily been something else. We could easily all have been eating NSET. Well, we lived in a nice tropical place. We could all be eating NSET. And so I really want to advocate for trying to, dis to identify and sustainably develop many of these underutilized crops, because currently we're very biased towards sort of Mediterranean fertile crescent cereals. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely, there are numerous alternative species. So where do we find them? Well, one place to find them is, of course, in herbaria. So that's, this is the, the very attractive wing C of, of Hughes herbarium. And then, of course, you know, so it's amazing to have these resources. And then, of course, there's phylogenetic discovery. So this is from a paper last year where we looked at all of the angiosperm plant families. And then the red bars show you the ones where we use a crop as a, uh, where we use one of these species as a crop. And the size of the red bar shows you the proportion of that plant family that we actually use. And you can see there's some we use quite a lot. Uh, the Musaceae is quite a, quite a small group. So we, we use a relatively large proportion of those. Uh, but there's whole areas of the tree of life that we don't use at all. And perhaps with more investigation into what many different communities around the world use or have used in the past, we can find many other species. And, and this doesn't just work for food crops, this works for timbers and medicines and all kinds of things as well. We had another paper where we were looking at what attributes are we likely to want in these plants in the future? So we know that CO2 is going to go up, we know that UV is going to go up, risk of flooding and drought might increase. Perhaps if we're being really pessimistic, insects are, are going to decline. So we may want to select for, for species that are good at selfing or that have families that are good at selfing. And so we can actually use this diversity and then we can think about what we need to have a successful food system. And we can actually target even new crops to domesticate and, and diversify. But then how does this fit in with conservation? So this is a bit of a, a simplification. Um, the, the experts are, are probably in, in the audience listening to this, but we have a wide variety of different types of protected area, right? key biodiversity areas, important bird areas. If we all depended on eating birds, then we'd be really good because we really know where all of those are, which is great. But we don't, in, in our view, have a really good um, system or framework for protecting field-based agrobiodiversity, perhaps because it's always been considered a little bit of the enemy. Now, I should say that we do have a ways of conserving crop wild relatives. Um, they are already factored into to some classifications of, of protected areas, in, including important plant areas. But take, for example, uh, communities in Ethiopia where the average farmer has half a hectare and grows 60 different species. How do we conserve that diversity and that incredible service that they're providing for us? And what we're interested in, what I'll talk about for just the last five minutes, is how we can find a way to protect that valuable resource, even though it might not be quite what we think of when we think of conservation and a protected area. And I should just say, some of you might be thinking about ex situ seed banks. That's uh, the, the Svalbard seed bank. And then this is the one down in Wakehurst at Kew, where we've got uh, thousands and thousands of species. And seed banks are really good, but it's really hard to conserve the indigenous knowledge that goes along with conserving those species. So take NSET, for example. Processing NSET into something you can eat is really, really, really tricky. It takes an enormous amount of knowledge. And so it's an awful lot easier to conserve it in situ with experts, the, the, the farmers themselves, than it is to, to just rely on that insurance policy, which is an ex situ seed bank. So how might it work? Well, those are, these are the IUCN management categories. And the ones we're really interested in are category five and six, the ones that integrate with people. And a really nice example of a, of a category five protected landscape that's working is Peru's potato park. And it's home to eight known native species and two and a half thousand varieties of potato. But there's not very many examples of this. There is a, an NSET park in Ethiopia, but it, it struggled to get off the ground. So how can we fit agrobiodiversity in, and 
farm-based agrobiodiversity into those kind of conservation frameworks. Well, what we're working on now in Ethiopia is we're trying to take those maps of agrobiodiversity. We're trying to understand which crops are declining and which ones are declining rapidly. Um, often there's a lot of investment and a lot of people advocating for introduced crops that have had a lot of investment and research. You know, everyone likes maize and potatoes, um, but that can be at the cost um, of indigenous crops that simply don't have that capacity to support them, but may offer. So if we look at NSET, people's use of NSET has probably evolved to help them buffer those, that seasonal insecurity. And we, we're working on a paper to demonstrate that at the moment. And then, of course, Criterion C, we, we want to be able to conserve crops in proximity to their, to their wild relatives to, or even to their, their wild species. So conserving them in situ so that you can allow those adaptive processes, allow that gene flow to continue to happen. And I should say what we really don't want to do is reinvent the wheel. We want to try and adapt or think of ways of applying all that existing work from, from the conservation literature just to expand it a little bit especially in centers of crop domestication, that map from Vavilov that you saw earlier, to allow that to happen and to conserve that diversity. And, and one last thing, who should pay for it? Well, I think we should all pay for it. Uh, you know, we should all invest in it. Uh, and this is some really nice work by a colleague called uh, uh, Adam Drucker, who, who we're, we're collaborating with. And uh, you might have heard of payments for ecosystem services. That's a, a, a really cool concept. But what about payments for agrobiodiversity conservation? So these farmers are doing us all a service by conserving hundreds and thousands of indigenous varieties that we might not use at the moment, but we might want to use them in the future. And they are probably, it's a lot cheaper probably for them to do it than it is for us to, to set up ex situ collections and grow them on and, and so on and so forth. So I would really advocate for us uh, all paying for that opportunity value that it provides us in the future and the food security that we'll, we'll all benefit from, not just, not just the communities that grow them now. And I should say we have to do all of this with a growing population that wants a higher standard of living. We're losing diversity irreversibly across plants and global climate change. So it's, it's not an easy challenge. So to, to sum up um, what I've talked to you about, there's a, a double biodiversity crisis. I think I'd, I'd really like to say we'd like to bend the curve of agrobiodiversity loss to, to coin a popular phrase. Uh, biodiversity and agrobiodiversity seem to be driven by similar processes. So that's really hinting at some really fascinating ecology and evolution. And area-based conservation has this incredible sort of backstory of, of development. And so we don't need to reinvent something new we, we hopefully can find a way of applying that to support uh, farmers that are, that are looking after this, this agrobiodiversity for us. And NSET is, is my favorite. It's a, it's a wonderful, weird, super crop, uh, but there's so many more just like it. Um, and, it's, and that's an area that Q's really interested in. And there's lots of people developing a lot of fascinating other species. So we really need to maximize our use of that diversity as well. And then just the last thing I'd say is that the burden of, of conserving this shouldn't fall on the world's poorest people. So at the moment, they are doing us all a collective service for free, essentially, by maintaining this agrobiodiversity and the indigenous knowledge that goes along with it. And it should be our top priority to try and ease some of that burden and help. Now, the last thing I'll, I'll just say is that we can't help noticing that we developed agriculture in the last 10,000 years and not any time in the sort of 100,000 years before that, that coincided with a period of comparative climate stability. Maybe it was that climate stability that made it a safe option to go for agriculture instead of continuing with hunter gathering. And so maybe agriculture is particularly good when we have climate stability. And so I think we really have our work cut out when we think about what's going to happen in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And so conserving agrobiodiversity really is going to give us uh, the, the most options and, uh, and not to put all our eggs in, 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 the, in the three baskets, the three crops that we use most now. So I should just finish by just acknowledging that a huge amount of people um, have I've collaborated with or, or have worked with me to, to develop this stuff, especially uh, Mary Bell, Sam Pirinon, Paul Wilkin, 
a, a huge number of people. Um, and so this is really a, a collective effort, especially with our, our partners in Ethiopia who, who really, really look after us when we're on field work out there. Um, so thank you very much for listening and um, ask away. Great. James, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, you didn't mention Cocho. Cocho is the is the, the the main food product of NSET, and it's kind of like a fermented bread, and it's got quite a strong flavour. And if you're really traditional, you eat it with um, uh, minced beef, essentially raw minced beef, and um, and it it really is delicious. But you mustn't have too much. That is a really strong memory of my one and only trip to to Ethiopia. James, I'll start the ball rolling with a few questions. In a, and firstly, thanks for recognizing Vavilov, one of the great unsung heroes in, in understanding biodiversity. And he did die of starvation in his prison, which is a terrible fate to, for anyone who's worked on food security. Not so long ago, what you're doing would, be, would have been described as economic botany. <laughs> Yeah. What is the difference between what you're doing now and economic botany? Well, do you know what? I can't tell you because uh, one of the papers I mentioned there, the first place we submitted to was economic botany and uh, they rejected it and said it wasn't economic botany. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. it, it's interesting because you're really going back to the origins of some of the Western botanical institutions as places to look for plants of utility. Um, and of course, you're driven by very different intents and very different relationships and working processes than those previous colonial exercises. And I know this is something that Q is taking very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I was driven by conservation to start with, you know, and it just, I just came to kind of, I guess, see from the perspective that having really good agriculture is actually probably one of the best tools for having successful conservation. So that's my motivation. I still love to be in the in a forest instead of in a field, but but um, but crops crop diversity and what we've done over human history is quite amazing. Right. I'm not seeing many hands, so I'm going to be ruthless and pick on some individuals that I know. Andrew, I was going to pick on you anyway. Andrew's just received um, collaborative funds grant from, from the Cambridge Conservation Initiative to look at future food security. So Andrew, over to you. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, James, thank you. I um, hugely enjoyed that. <laughs> hugely, it was great. Um, I, I got a couple of questions. Um, so one was a kind of geeky question, the other one was a practical one. So the geeky question was, I was struck by your um, map of um, of edible plant diversity and by the relative paucity of those uh, recorded species in Latin America. And I wondered, compared with Africa and, and Southeast Asia, against the background of where biodiversity as a whole is. And I wondered if, if you want, if you had any ideas about that and whether that might be linked with the loss of so much human culture there, uh, probably as a result of the, um, you know, the, the so-called Columbia exchange. Columbia exchange. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I and then it, another, another one, sorry. Um, well, I think it absolutely could be. Um, I think my, my worry would be disentangling real patterns from the fact that our data is really, really biased. So, for, ex for example, you know, I think we know quite a lot about Colombian, so Q's had a very long collaboration with Colombia specifically. Um, so we know, have a lot of data about Colombian crops and Colombian edible plants, but for other countries, we don't. And so it could well be a, a big historical bias against our records for, for South America, or it could be, like you say, a, a real effect. But the, it's a bit, 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 I wouldn't have a lot of confidence at this stage of disentangling real from artifact. Okay, thank you. M Mike, uh, can I carry on with the other question? Or, or Please do, yes. Okay, my other one was uh, a more practical one. Um, I agree completely with you uh, that agriculture is the uh, source of the answer to, efficient agriculture is the source of the answer to conservation. We live on a crowded planet and we have to make best use of the space we've got. Uh, and, uh, and my question was in those areas, many of the areas you're talking about, there is an inherent tension in wanting to um, maintain uh, 
uh, boost perhaps even agriculture in the same places that you need to boost um, uh, you want that are particularly important priorities for, for for wild biodiversity conservation as well and the answer presumably to unlocking those lies in yields over the long run I just wondered if there's what data there is um, whether people have looked at this to explore the long run yields i.e taking into account resilience um, of um, agro-biodiverse systems compared with, um, uh, you know, monoculture or two, three crop systems in the same places controlling for all those confounding variables. If there's any evidence um, yeah. that, that points that this is the way out of this conundrum. Well, I've seen, um, I've seen a handful of more experimental studies sort of in these Ecotron type, type simulations. There was one that just came out a couple of weeks ago that showed um, higher production in diverse systems where you have crops, multiple species being grown together, higher biomass uh, compared to just monocultures. But in terms of in agro-biodiverse developing countries like Ethiopia, one of the problems is that you've had, I, I basically I'm just scared of all the covariates, to be honest, because you've had absolutely massive growth in the area under agriculture, and that's gone from the best land to progressively using worse and worse and worse land as you've gone through. You've had a growing proportion of introduced crops. So you might still have agrobiodiversity, but you're, you're losing some of the indigenous species that have evolved there. Um, and then you've had quite a lot of very positive agricultural invention that is basic intervention that has basically improved yields across almost everything. Um, and then one might think it's a really easy question to, to think about ag uh, intercropping. You know, when we were designing one of our studies for our last thing in Ethiopia, it's like, ah, oh, tech box, is, is this crop intercropped with something else or is it not? And then you go to sort of Basketo or the Gamo Highlands and in four square meters, there's like six species all underneath the tree that's also used. And it's absolutely just crazy. It's like a you know, just a botanical collection that everything is edible. And so, so I, I get exactly where you're coming from. And I think that's the really fascinating question to really show it in a, in a, in a working system as opposed to experimentally. Um, but I, I don't know where the, where the compromise between real world relevance and experimental rigor is best to hedge your bets, to be honest. I wish I did. I'd like to do it. James, we've got a question for you here from Gospel Adagoke, and Gospel's asking, can insects be introduced into other regions of Africa to complement other food crops being planted? So that's to the practical. Yeah, yeah. this is where I give my, my personal opinion that does not represent uh, anyone or my employer or anything like that. Um, Ethiopia rightly has very, very strict rules on letting its genetic diversity and, and species diversity out of the country. And that is to protect it. And it's had a bad experience with a crop called teff in the past. And I completely see exactly where they're coming from. But on the other hand, our modeling suggests that NSET could really help some other countries. And you'd have to be able to not just transfer the crop but the indigenous knowledge as well. My wild aspiration, and it's not my crop and I'm not Ethiopian and I don't have any say, but my wild aspiration is just think what bilateral aid between these agrobiodiverse developing countries could be like if, if Ethiopia was to say donate its crop to Uganda or Zambia and Zambia donated some agrobiodiversity in return everyone would benefit and in, in fact one of my colleagues in Ethiopia has been exploring the idea of introducing insects to new regions in Ethiopia and seeing how difficult it is for people to take up this new crop and also to Zambia. So it's something that's really of interest. And we're, we're not just picking on NSET because we think it's the best thing ever. We're focusing on areas that have low agricultural inputs, have extremely high population densities. We're not just looking at places where the climate happens to match. We're looking at where has the social cultural conditions where a small amount of NSET could really make the difference every five years buffering that bad harvest. <laughs> So I think yes, um, but we have a very long way to go to ever see that. Right. 
Thank you, James. I think also you've got to realise it's the cooking traditions have to migrate as well. Yeah. You've got to know what to do with the, with the crop. Gianluca, you have a question. Yeah, yeah thank you, James. That was really great. Uh, I kind of have a question related to that, which is uh, to what you were just talking about. Is NSET then now being used in all the areas of Ethiopia that you would expect it to be used in? So all the areas where, where it's climatically suitable or culturally mm -hmm. suitable? Because I guess before even going to other countries, is there not a lot of scope for its, its, its increased use in some areas of Ethiopia? Yeah, so, so the answer is no. Um, so our models predict a lot of suitability in the north. And what's uh, really interesting is that one of the first um, accounts of northern Ethiopia was a guy called James Bruce in like 1780, something like that. And uh, he wrote and drew NSET from the shores of Bahadar uh, in the north. And you pretty much don't find NSET there anymore. And there are some, um, some suggestions that NSET was much, once much more widespread in the north, but disease wiped it out. And there is a major disease of NSET called bacterial wilt, which, which, we're, which we're interested in. So definitely there's scope for expansion in Ethiopia. And the, the socio-cultural history of why it might not be grown there anymore is equally really fascinating. And I think that would be a, a nice collaboration with an Ethiopian historian to really try and get to the bottom of that. But yeah, it has an incredibly defined boundary now. It just starts within a few kilometers, you know, from no NSET to lots of NSET. But there are big areas that, that we, th we think are climatically suitable, have wild NSET, but don't have domesticated. And it's the same question as to lots of our other crops went around the world. Bananas, incredibly successful. You know, they went around the world 3,000 years ago. Why didn't NSET? I mean, these are the questions we just wonder about. Got a, thank you, James. I've got a question from James Bell. Um, I'll read it to you. So a question from an uh, errant fisheries scientist, self-defining. How do you think the conservation regarding edible biodiversity on land compares with comparable production of food, marine or freshwater food production? Yeah, so I guess really outside of my expertise, but with fish, don't we quite often sell other species as one we know, because we have, you know, the consumer has poor knowledge of lots of species. I'm not really sure, but I guess, um, I could do a sea spiracy thing and just say, save all of the land biodiversity by eating all the, the ocean biodiversity. And you could just argue the same thing back, I suppose. Uh, I, I just don't know, but I guess diversity of what we use on land is good. And I would think diversifying the species we use from the oceans is also probably a good strategy. James, do you want to come back with a comment on that? Uh, well, if I can direct people away from sea spiracy, that's a good start. Um, but uh, yeah, and it just it sort of occurred to me around the, sort of the, the diversity of um, sort of diet and, you know, thinking sort of, you know, a single meal in Vietnam can have more fish and more marine species in it than an average British person would eat an entire year. Yeah. So I was just wondering if there's that kind of, there's a parallel there between the sort of, uh, sort of the economic status and uh, yeah, how, how picky you can afford to be essentially and um, where you source that food from. Um, yeah, and I think that nutritional diversity thing is a really interesting one. So there's quite a lot of interest to some colleagues at Kew about does, does agrobiodiversity bring you nutritional diversity and nutritional security as well as just calories and, and, and these kind of questions, which I guess is, is similar. So I, I think that we think so, but the jury's out, I guess. Yes. James, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've um, come to the end of today's session. That was fascinating. And I, I think what, what I particularly like is, is the overlap of genetics, culture, anthropology, history. And the fact that there is intense pride amongst the owners of these crops that they hold global and regional patrimony. Um, I did a little bit of work years ago on breadfruit in the South Pacific and it's exactly the same case there. Any village will have a range of, of cultivars for different seasons, different soils, different intensities of rainfall. Some will go through a hurricane better than others. So, James, thank you. I'm delighted you've spread our agenda to, in, to include the, the crops. Um, I personally think that domestication is, is one of the defining factors of our species. It's, it's what we do and what we 
doing now with cobbles and sagnum is actually the start of another process of domestication that we started eight, nine, ten thousand years ago. So James, thank you. Um, I suspect many of us will want to follow up conversation with you and um, see where we can develop some links with, uh, with Q and the research community and the conservation community here. So yeah, we'd, we'd, you, really, um, we'd really welcome collaboration, especially sort of area based conservation experts. You know, we, you're the experts on this, so we'd really benefit from your input. So, so feel free to get in touch. There's an open invitation for everyone. I think Andrew's already working out a, an email. James, thank you again. That was brilliant. Many thanks. Thank you, everyone. And we will start the series again in September. So thanks for, thanks for coming. Take